Good evening or good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're at. This is Michael Cross here with another exciting episode of Unlock the Door Radio, where we go by the motto uh, that you should question authority. And that comes directly from one of our founding fathers here in the United States, Benjamin Franklin himself. And speaking of Benjamin Franklin, who was a really foremost scientist of his era, um, I'd like to deal with something tonight with which is going to have a profound effect on humanity. As much as the elect harnessing electricity has had on humanity, what's coming up in the near future is big time, and it's going to change everything. It's a game changer for every aspect of life. So tonight we have none other than Daniel Estelin, who is an author. He's written 12 books. He has a program on RT. And tonight he's going to be sharing some information on transhumanism now again thank you for coming on daniel thank you so much for having me on your show it's a pleasure excellent you know i have a real strong interest in transhumanism i'm really into science but also social science and you know it seems like very few people know anything about it they think it's like a science fiction thing like on movies like uh, elysium or something like that but your book and research seems to indicate that it's way more than just a science fiction plot. Could you go ahead and just kind of inform our viewers where you're coming from? Well, it's actually a lot more than uh, science fiction. It's actually uh, science reality. And uh, <coughs> first of all, uh, uh, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, and thank you so much for the invitation to be on your show. It's a pleasure for me to, uh, to share this time with you. Um, there's a lot of, uh, obviously, uh, speculation about how much of my new book, Trans Evolution, The Coming Age of Human Deconstruction, is, is fiction, how much is fact, and how much is kind of a mix of the two. Uh, I assure you, uh, from, from all the research and all the footnotes in the book, um, there's over 600 footnotes in the book, that it has very little to do with science fiction <clears throat> and all to do with reality for the very, very near future. The, the basis and the emphasis of the book is that uh, we're standing at the cusp of the greatest evolutionary change in the history of mankind. What's coming in the next few years, and when I say few, the definition is about three to five years max, is gonna completely redefine the very definition of what a human being is on the planet Earth. In fact, I can tell you uh, without uh, any doubt at all that the generation of our children, the kids who are today at 15 or 20 years old, they're the one last 100% human generation of people on the planet Earth. Their children, uh, my grandchildren, they're going to be anything but human. They'll be transhuman children. They'll be false human. They'll be man-machines. They'll be cyborgs. They'll be beings who are not totally human as a result of uh, synthetic biology. Um, our DNAs are being changed as we speak through genetically modified crop. And uh, again, what uh, is about to hit us, the human beings, of humanity over the next few years, combined with all the, you know, geopolitical changes in the world, which needless to say, I explain in the book, are not some irrelevant facts, which we shouldn't worry about, but very much form part of this continuum, which includes all of these elements, such as transhumanism, uh, trans evolution, uh, synthetic biology, space exploration, uh, economy, destruction of the world economy. And as I said, again, it's the first book out there that puts all of these elements on one plateau and gives us a roadmap of humanity or for humanity of our near future. Well, you know, um, a while back I ran across this uh, report and it was called the National Intelligence Council's uh, well predictions for 2030. And essentially they predict, I mean, if you read this, it seems that yes, they talk about, they talk about population growth. They talk about um, changing geopolitical realities. But they also bring up that in 2030, exactly what you said, people are going to be, you know, the, what we see as the Internet today will be like thinking about when, you know, people were kids in the 70s playing <coughs> uh, Pong on like, a little um, Atari system. You know, the... Uh... All of these reports actually have a basis, and the basis for, for these reports that you mentioned is uh, uh, the report that I got, which is actually how I got uh, um, 
interested in in writing this book 10 years ago so uh, the kernel of, of what today is is my new book trans evolution uh began back in 2005 at the bilderberg conference in rotha in germany when one of my sources gave me a partial uh, it wouldn't be a report at the time it, it would be um um, it will be uh, a, a draft of what later turned out to be a blueprint on the uh, future strategic trends for the entire planet Earth. And the report, which came out in uh, 2007, is called Strategic Trends Report 2007-2036, a secret source document on the future of humanity. Today, you can actually download it for free off of the Internet. It's a 91-page report. I very strongly suggest People download it and read it. It's 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 astonishing uh, at how well these people understand the future of humanity. And when I say these people, these aren't some mindless or faceless bureaucrats. These are some of the greatest evolutionary thinkers, futurists, scientists, social scientists, geostrategists in world history. Again, Strategic Trends Report 2007, 2036. And some of the conclusions of that report are... Uh, striking and startling. For example, between now and 2036, the world's population will explode to 10 billion people <clears throat> in one generation. About two-thirds of the world's population will be living in areas of water stress. So we're talking about 230, by 2036, so there are 10 billion people. About 7 billion people will be living in areas where there's going to be lack of water. So lack of food, water, medicine, proper hygiene, education, basic human necessities will spell collapse, according to the report. And without mincing words, these people state explicitly that a growing gap between majority and a small number of highly visible super rich is likely to pose an increasing threat to social order and stability. And the result of that will, uh, will result in civil war intercommunal violence, insurgency, pervasive criminality, and uh, widespread disorder. And there is, as a result of that, they're talking about uh, the breakdown of the very political international system and the globalized economy, which will result in the breakdown of countries. And by the 2036, countries will be replaced in most parts of the world by mega cities, and this report defines megacities by population base of anywhere from 20 to 30 billion people. And again, so what we're looking at, at uh, you know, the, the, um, the change, the generational change in the very definition and understanding of what humanity is and how the world itself is going to be run. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're describing for you know the listeners – is essentially a Hunger Games scenario, kind of a dystopian future where there's going to be the haves who will be like in, you know, maybe a more modified version of our gated cities concepts and the have nots, which will uh, be in increasingly uh, competing with each other for what limited resources that are still out there available for them. Well, actually, the Strategic Trends Report calls it the, the calls the future world the world of Blade Runner. It's a <clears throat> it's a very appropriate definition because if you think back to the Blade Runner when it first came out in the early 1980s and a script play, uh, a sc screenplay written by uh, a brilliant American screenwriter by the name of David Peebles. It's uh, the same guy who actually wrote Accidental Tourist, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, <clears throat> it uh, it very much fits the bill of what that world. The future near world will look like, and uh, when you again, when you combine the technological advancements in all of its manifestations, in all of its fields, as I explain painstakingly in my new book, um, you have to understand that these people uh, who work on these futuristic reports and scenarios, they don't make mistakes ever. There's never any room for mistakes in what they do because every element of power is controlled by the people who run the world from behind the scenes. And one of the reasons, again, <coughs> it's something that <coughs> to a lot of people is very difficult to understand, is because people think of politics as uh, foreign and national, where there is, in fact, national foreign policies 
have very little to do with the world, the way the world is run and have very little effect on, on the world's development. It's the global politics, which affect everything that's around us. And these global politics are not run by Congress, by Barack Obama's, <clears throat> by uh, Putin's or anybody else. It's run on a supranational level by these, call them globalist elites, whatever you want to call them from behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. We well, you know there's something interesting, and that is that I was listening to a Nobel Prize dinner. Uh, they had a presentation where they had a lot of the Nobel Prize winners from a few years back. And the question came up of what would the future uh, entail in regards to longevity? And it wasn't a question of whether there would be super increased longevity in the future. And I'm not talking about people reaching 100 potentially, but we're talking like 200 and beyond. And you know, <coughs> that was the that was what the scenario was. The thing is that every time I bring up transhumanism with people, the first thing they bring up is, well, there will be overpopulation. How will the elite deal with the idea that there could be a doubling of the lifespan? Well, first of all, <clears throat> you have to understand that uh, man's uh, uh, future is uh, uh, in space. I think it has to be obvious to anyone out there. In other words, you know, if we extrapolate what we are today, which is 7 billion people, to the next 50 years from now, and we go to 10, 12, 15, 20 billion people, you know, um, and it's not a, a question of, of space because there's more than enough space, you know, for 50, 60 billion people on the planet Earth. You know, you can put them all together. I mean, the people we have right now, you can put them all in Texas and you're still going to have room left over. OK, but the point is, is we're running out of natural resources and we're running out of water. OK, India, which is a very large country with over one billion people, they're out of water. So the fact is that, you know, we have such incredible water stress across the globe, you know, obviously makes one wonder what's going to happen in the very near future. And the fact is that if we go 50 years, 100 years, how about 1,000 years? How about 10,000 years from now? I mean, we, we have to extrapolate and plan ahead. Planet Earth is only this big. I mean, you can't extend it. You can't make it bigger. You can only make it smaller as a result of more and more people and, you know, greater and greater stress on the natural resources. Which means that the elite, they understand very, very well. And this is, you know, some of the most intricate things of, of this book. That it's a very good question, by the way, Michael, that you've asked. You know, it's the problem of population is not a problem. Because the elite understand that sooner or later, we're going to have to conquer the galaxies in space. What they're doing right now is they're saying, uh, you know, that there's just too many people on the planet Earth. We need to, you know somehow reduce the world's population and need us to say, you know, reduction doesn't mean them, it means us. Now, uh, you see the way it works is that progress and development is directly proportional to population density. So if we have progress, if we have technological development to sustain a population base of 7 billion people, and you can actually develop and build on this growth and, and, and technology, you can actually go to the next plateau, you know, 10 billion people, because we're going to have wealth, we're going to have, you know, bigger families, more mouths to feed. More mouths to feed means there's less food for them. And for the Rockefellers of this world to survive, most of us have to die, which is why if you kind of look around us, around the world, we're seeing things like, you know, terminologies demand destruction, zero growth, deindustrialization, Club of Rome's, you know, famous limits to growth report back in 72 when they're talking about, you know, Malthusian population reduction schemes. And so the elite understand that if there's no technological advancement, we're going to go to hell. And this is exactly what they're doing. So on the one hand, they're reducing the world's population, not by killing us, you know, uh, 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 outright, you know, with bullets. But by reducing the, you know, the, the economic growth and development, they're reducing the population base because we need technology in order to develop the necessary ways to have all these people survive. So on the one hand, as they're deindustrializing the world, setting us to hell in a handbasket, they're using, you know, the gazillions of dollars of their wealth to develop, you know, and discover these amazing technologies absolutely mind-boggling technologies, everything from brain enhancements, you know, to, to uh, um, neuroscience, to nanotechnology, uh, you know, synthetic biology, and so, you know, space exploration. So they understand so that this gap between us and them is getting greater and greater because there was a point about 20 years ago 
<clears throat> as a result of <clears throat> information revolution, computer technology, where, you know, anybody, be it you, me, somebody sitting, you know, in Japan or uh, an Aborigine sitting, sitting in the middle of, you know, uh, an outback in Australia or a Koya Indian sitting on a tree in a, you know, a Bolivian Amazon rainforest. If you have a computer, if you have internet connection and you have Google, you have as much knowledge as any of these secret societies throughout history. And so they really understood that for them, again, to widen this gap because they couldn't afford for the 99.9%, .9%, you know, to reduce the gap in, in knowledge. So again, for them to widen this gap, they're destroying the world's economy on purpose, while on the other hand, they're using the technological advancements, you know, to separate the widening gap between us and them. This is a very intricate point. So, you know, to go back and to, you know, answer concretely your question, they're not concerned about overpopulation because they know it's a hoax. They understand that the reason they need to reduce the world's population has nothing to do with the fact that there's too many of us. But the fact is, is that if you have 10, 20 billion people, it's very difficult to manage such an incredible load of humanity when there are so few of them. They don't need that many people. They need fewer people, just enough to do what needs to be done and the rest out. But on the other hand, they also understand that our future as humanity, and we, the people, have to understand this, is not here on the planet Earth. It's our calling to discover, you know, the universal principles of nature and to conquer the galaxies. It's out there to be conquered, you know, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God. The idea of immortality has nothing to do with how many times you cross yourself per day. It has to do with assuring the survival of the human species. And for us to survive a million years from now, we must conquer every nook and corner of the galaxy without even mentioning the fact, and I finish, that, you know, uh, in, in space, uh, in the solar system, you know, moon, Mars, etc., you have all the natural resources you would need to continue growing technologically on the planet Earth and begin the space exploration age and begin the colonizing of the moon, of, of Mars and so on, so that the future generations by about the year 2050, as this report, Strategic Trends Report 2007-2036 predicts, by 2050, we'll be going in large numbers to Mars. It's like taking a subway, except we'll be going to Mars. Oh, that's, I'd look forward to that. Hopefully I'm still alive then. <laughs> the, you know, maybe some of the other aspects not look for, but I want, I want to get to the idea of how human evolution is going to change. And I'm wondering, am I too far off in saying that if we look at technology the way it's going now, that within a couple of generations, it will be seen as akin to not sending your kid to school to not go in and have the <laughs> DNA screen and therefore produce the best designer child you can possibly design. I mean, you got uh, uh, geneticists such as Gregory Stock that predict that in the future this will be very common that we will um, that people will be designing the genetics of their kids. You know, it's it's uh, <clears throat> one of the things about this book, and again, there's a lot of stuff out there in the market about about technology, but there's no book out there that actually puts all of these elements together, you know, with futurism, technology, uh, geopolitics, understanding the world of work, the, the way the world works from the point of view of secret society. And, you know, you have to remember, Michael, that, you know, I'm the author of the true story of the Bilderberg Group that, you know, that brought out to the soul point all of this stuff which a lot of people suspected, but, but nobody really knew. And now, 10 years after my book was published, you know, Bilderberg is, you know, as, as a term, has become, you know, part of our lore. We, you know, we talk about Bilderberg when we refer to anything secret or private. So the fact is that there's, you know, people talk about future and technology, but they miss other elements, which are very important. You know, economy, uh, spy, science, you know, geostrategy, how media is controlled, and so on and so forth. As far as the technology itself, it's absolutely inevitable that, you know, cybernetic enhancement, technological enhancement of human performance is going to take place over the next few years. It's, abs it's, 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 it's unfathomable to think that, you know, people are going to continue being people. Augmentation is going to be, you know, some wet dream of, of, 
of you know nut cases. It's not like that at all. You know, man machine fusion is obviously is just a matter of time. It's literally around the corner. What you refer to is something else. You know, one of the biggest breakthroughs in recent history, scientists have created a synthetic genome that can self-replicate. And what they've done is they've taken a cell and modified the genes of a cell by inserting DNA from another organism, and the bacteria replicated itself, thus creating a second generation <coughs> of the synthetic G DNA. And the organism will do exactly what the scientists intended it to do. A living thing, but under the control of man. So you see, you know, if the 19th century was all about the revolution of harnessing energy from fossil fuels, which means oil, and a 20th century is about exploiting the power of data, which is computers. This century is about controlling biology. Well, and what is amazing about this is that the cell was assembled and sparked into life in a laboratory. And this technology has literally taken us across a threshold. It's a turning point that marked the coming age of this new science called synthetic biology, found an ambition that one day, very, very soon, Michael, over the next couple of years, max, we will, without any doubt whatsoever, will be able to design and manufacture a human being in a laboratory the same way you, know, you can manufacture, I don't know, a, a, a cake, for example. In other words, you know, you can get a DNA of anything here on Earth, and you can create an organism that never before existed entirely from non-living materials. This is mind-boggling. And what the scientists are doing, they're creating new life <clears throat> at the same time, you know, as we're creating life forms that the human immune system and the world has never thus far experienced. And as such, it will revitalize perennial questions about the, uh, the significance of life, what it is, why it is important, and what role humans should have in its future. And you mentioned a very interesting idea, the idea of, you know, putting together a, a human being. Well, that's that's exactly what it's going to be done. I don't know if you saw a film a few years back with Jude Lowe called Gattaca. Oh, we have that technology. We have that technology, exactly. Absolutely right. The Chinese, you know? I read that the Chinese are actually trying to determine, um, looking at, the genetic structures and genomes of people that are high achievers. And then their idea well, would be that you'd give a woman a fertility drug. She'd produce 20 eggs. You'd fertilize them and then see which one would be the smartest, healthiest kid and then implant that one. But not only that, they've already gone beyond that. Now they're using, you know, DNAs of third individuals to mix in. In other words, they're mixing in other people's DNA in with the couples to literally produce a new breed of humans. So it's not a question of a man and a woman, you know, mating, you have a child. No, you have men and a woman and then somebody else's genes, okay, DNA. So you can actually literally build the human being block by building block as if it was Lego. But there's a darker side to all of this. You know, consider, for example, I don't know, people like me or criminals or dissidents or people who think differently from the official party line of one world state. Well, we could have our children's DNA altered during pregnancy as punishment for our non-obedience. And what's more, by altering the DNA, the private corporations and governments who will obviously work hand in glove, they can create a society without memory. In other words, people whose life experiences are stored on a memory drive running on a one-week cycle through modified DNA over and over and over and over again. So you won't need a history, you won't need geography, you won't need photographs, you won't need anything at all, because after one week, everything will be canceled and you start again. And this is very, very, very much possible. And this isn't, again, some you know crazy scientific dream come true. No, this is Huxley's 21st century scientific dictatorship without tears. This is exactly... How, how they understand transhumanism. It sounds weird, but it might be that I know that uh, Bertrand Russell talked about having certain traits within the elite and then the other trait, you know, the, the masses would have those traits spread out. And I'm just thinking if you look at things like, oh, something you know, weird, like psychopathy. I mean, for someone in a leadership position, they might want their children to have a lack of empathy to take, you know, to, to be their rulers. 
but you might want to breed that out in the lower classes because that could lead to rebellion. I mean, most people think, well, that's, you know, there's other things too, like uh, ADHD, things like that are usually associated with corporate leaders. I mean, and then in America, you drug all these boys that have you know, like these symptoms that they call ADHD. But, but if you screen at the beginning, you could get rid of all these people you don't want. Exactly. You know, technology will increasingly dominate the world. There's no doubt about it. As population, resource exploitation, and potential social conflict grows. Therefore, the success of this convergent technologies priority area <clears throat> is essential to the future of humanity. You see, the very idea of transhumanism, it fills people's hopes and minds with dreams of becoming superhuman. <clears throat> you know, being able to upload your mind, uh, you know, download information on the computer, you know, through, through microchips. But the fact of the matter is that the true goal is the removal of that pesky human free will itself. So post-humanity will be a new human, which has been genetically engineered and brain chip for total control, part man and part machine. This new man of the near future will no longer have a need of the sexual reproductive function. And if the elite's plan is to reduce the world's population, you know, I can't think of a better way to do that. Well, you're talking about a beehive thing. I mean, it goes back to the old, the idea like in ancient Mesopotamia and, and back, maybe back to Noah's time, you know, the idea that the beehive is the ideal society, the the, you know, the workers, and then you have a very small, like, queen class and so forth. Uh, the definition of human being, do you think we'll get to a point where a woman could go in, she could have an egg cell extracted, and she could purchase a synthetic sperm cell and fuse the two together? And if so, what would you call the child? Would it be human? Well, it's a very good question. <clears throat> I, I mean, you were very close to, you know, to, to achieving that. Very close, you know, from 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 point of view of synthetic biology. As I said to you earlier, Michael, you know, I don't know. It would be a post-human, you know, a transhuman, uh, you know, man-machine, cyborg, you know, a thing that's not totally human. I don't know what we're going to call it. We're going to have to come up with a new definition. You know, there's right now three sexes, right? There's men, <clears throat> there's women, and there's, you know, the transsexuals. That's a sex in, in Germany on a passport. OK, you have this new area where they call it transsexuals. OK, it's a sex now. Now, uh, in the very near future, we're going to have a first fourth definition, which is transhuman, the fusion of man machine. You mentioned, you know, uh, beehive. Well, you know, the transhumanists have a popular term called hive mind, which refers to the giant collective intelligence that might be created when people all over the world link their brains together with technology. And now people saying, well, now it's not going to, you know, it's not going to happen. It doesn't exist. Some crazy, you know, nonsense. Well, we already have hive mind. It's called, it's, except that today it's called cloud. And now you upload your files onto this, you know, invisible effervescent cloud. In the near future, you'll be able to upload your mind and live forever in cyberspace because that's how the elite understand immortality. So, in other words, you know, through this hive mind. We're creating a whole new intelligence through symbiotic existence. It is this uh, uh, human beehive, which has been the ideal society in the eyes of the elite for a very long time. It is the template for the post-humanity, the ultimate slave race, scientifically designed to never rebel and the wholesale disappearance of the human being with our divine spark of reason at the expense of group speak, group think, and also group actions. Okay, wow, <laughs> that now that goes beyond any dystopian uh, program I've ever seen. Now you, you mentioned I got to ask this, you know, because I think it's I think it's possible. You know, nanotechnology. Most people never even heard of it, or if they have, it's been in some. You know, it's not even mentioned much in sci-fi. But you mentioned the thing about transsexuals. Well, isn't it true that with nanotechnology, that at least in theory that at least the beginning of this, people will be able to redesign their bodies since these can work on the cellular level. I mean, this could offer people, I mean, you'd have all kinds of variations that people might go for. Um, I, I, you know, I think you're right. I think most people don't know what nanotechnology is. I mean, I'm sure they've heard the term, but, uh, you know, nano is, is, 
is something very, very small. It's a space between one atom and about 400 atoms. And just to give you an idea, you know, in terms of space, you know, and length, if you think of an Earth of a new scale, let's say a billionth of a meter. So, for example, the distance between the moon and the Earth is about one billion meters. That's a day's travel. The difference between a meter and a nanometer, okay, is, which is oh, a billionth of a meter, is uh, literally takes about a few seconds of, of, of travel time. And a nanoscale is about 100,000 times smaller than your strand of hair. Now, what happens, you know, and the reason this technology is so incredible and it, and it is so new, it's just been, you know, discovered about 20 years ago. And the reason this, you know, the technology is so amazing is that at a nanometer scale, at this tiny, tiny, tiny little scale, everyday materials, they start to act in unimaginable ways. So, for example, you know, we know that if you take, I don't know, uh, a piece of steel, a large chunk of steel, it acts a certain way. There are certain characteristics that it has. OK, stainless steel doesn't corrode, et cetera, et cetera. But when you take it and you reduce it to a tiniest, you know, area, which is a nano area, then the material, the steel, begins to act and begins to take on properties which, you know, up until very recently we didn't even know existed. So the behavior of these nanomaterials, they change as the size becomes so small as compared to a large amount of the same material. It is a space in which quantum behavior begins to replace the Newtonian physics. You see, uh, Michael, in any direction you go, if you go up or down, uh, there's comes, there comes a point where you hit limits set by physical law. It's called Moore's law. Quantum mechanics, speed of light, gravitational forces. You know, But what happens is, well, the advent of this new science and technology related to the genetic revolution, because again, nano and genetic revolution, they're very much interconnected. We can literally rewrite our genetic construct. So in a span of a generation, you know, check it out. We've gone from genetically modified plants to genetically modified animals. You remember the dolly, no? Mm -hmm. Sheep dolly. Well, the next step, obviously, is going to be what? Genetically modified humans. And when you start, you know, mixing genetically modified humans and human beings and you start fusing them together, who knows what's going to come out? But what is absolutely certain is that nanotechnology is going to play a very, very important role, you know, in this generational change that we as people are about to embark on. Yeah, because you can, I mean, the idea is, I guess, in theory, you could program these things to then program your DNA. And therefore, you could make yourself into something different. That's well, there, really bizarre. You know, there's something else about nanotechnology. Nano robots or nanobots, as they're called, okay, uh, they're amazing. Again, as, as I said earlier, technology is, is an amazing thing. We need it. All these people think that, you know, if we don't have the technology, we can, you know, have a better planet and live longer or, you know, have cleaner air. It's all nonsense. It's nonsense to the point it only goes to show you how uh, illiterate people are as far as technology is concerned. We need nanotechnology, for example, to cure cancer because you can, you know, program uh, nanobots to discover cancerous cells and kill them before they become fully blown cancerous cells. You can send nanobots, and if we have some kind of a, a brain seizure, a possible brain seizure, they can fix it before it becomes reality. And so the nanobots were created to be like life itself, to be able to reproduce and to serve our needs. And the intelligence of a nanotech is not going to be in one nanobot. It will be in the collective intelligence of trillions and quadrillions of nanobots working together and pooling their thinking resources. And you can program these things specifically, for example, so they attack only people with certain characteristics. You know, they'll be like Hitler's, you know, wet dream come true. So anything when we talk about technology, it's always a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we need the technology, and especially if it's used wisely for the betterment of humanity, we're all going to be the better for it. But if they lead, knowing what they've done to humanity in the past, and if we extrapolate what we know about their actions into the future, we have very little reason to believe 
that they're going to be using these gazillions of dollars of discoveries to help humanity. Now, but the danger of the nanotechnology is uh, <coughs> nano weapons, which is weapons made of you know nanotech, they attack a target, for example, at a molecular level, then use the molecules of the target as raw materials to replicate more copies of themselves because they're living organisms. So in this way, you know, small amounts of these replicators could have the capacity to destroy anything on Earth. You know, they would, you know, start by devouring plants, animals, and ultimately people. And this is how wars of the future will be fought. And I can tell you categorically, because I've given several conferences, I'm not going to say where, you know, but to joint chiefs of staff of certain nations in South America, where they are already looking at the very near uh, scenario on, on the battlefields. They're not talking about, you know, guerrillas or terrorists against, you know, regular army. They're talking about men machines supported by nanotechnology against cyborgs supported by men machines. This is the wars of the very near future. And as I said, again, this isn't some, you know, crazy outfit in the middle of the jungle. These are the joint chiefs of staff and the top three and four star generals of armed forces of some of the most important nations in South America already working on these scenarios of the near future war scenarios, forgive the repetition, on the battlefield. And if they're working on it, I'm sure the Chinese, Russians, and the United States, amongst they, others, are also hey, working on exactly. it. Exactly. You know, and uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, but there's a uh, um, Hollywood is is a great gauger of you know of of technological advancements. I'm not talking about Hollywood as in you know Driving Miss Daisy these kinds of films. I'm talking about high tech films. We've seen Terminator. Well, the you know augmented reality that's already a reality. Blade Runner that's the world that these people think we're going to be living in. RoboCop, okay. Then you have GI Joe two which is all based on nanotech, which is how Joes get killed in the beginning. Uh, Transcendence with Johnny Depp, that's coming up in the next few weeks, where Johnny Depp plays the role of, you know, world's famous transhumanist engineer who gets killed by, uh, you know, this, this terrorist anti-tech uh, group. And as he's dying, they upload his mind onto the computer and his mind tries to take over the world. Well, this is their, you know, wet dream come true. Gattaca, public enemy, with Will Smith, hey, you know, there you have your NSA technology. I am legend also with Will Smith. Remember that one about, you know, the deadly virus? Yeah. I it, I can't remember the one that had uh, Keanu Reeves. Where they, it was the up, the remake of uh, when the – Well, Earth yeah, it's Matrix still. and you also had Minority Report. Yeah, but there was one Bill, where these robots like you described, yeah, that, like nanobots, go out to kill humanity to save the planet. Uh, humanity is not the planet. I, I don't. I don't know. That's not Minority Report. It's not Philip K. Dick. No, I think it was the remake of When the Earth Stood Still. Uh, I don't know. I didn't see that film. But you know, you look at all these films. You know, Moon, Minority Report, Avatar, video games like Deus Ex, Ulysses that you mentioned earlier. This is what you know. There's people how they understand the world. Men in Black. You know, everybody's seen Men in Black. You know, remember that uh, the uh, the technology for Amnesia Beam. You know, when Will Smith put his glasses on, say, you don't see it, you didn't see anything, click, and people didn't even know what that what hit them. Well, this technology exists. It's called Active Denial System, ADS. It's a byproduct of larger ongoing research looking for technology that could delete and then replace your memory. And this is already very much reality. And there's a new series on TV, which I very strongly advise people watch. It's called Almost Human on Fox. And it's an amazing series, and I'm not promoting transhumanism, you know. I'm just saying as a series itself, which gives us a look, in, you know, a peek into technological future, it's very, very much real. Uh, allegedly, the, you know, the series takes place in 2048. Well, you know, one of the characters is a cyborg cop. But the technology is so advanced right now that we can kind of have this over the next three years or so. And this series is deals specifically with neuroscience, which is a study of the nervous system. And you know, Michael, uh, today with advances in chemistry, computer science, engineering, medicine, and uh, so many other disciplines, neuroscience now also includes the study of the molecular, cellular, developmental, structural, functional, evolutionary, computational, 
and medical aspects of the nervous system. So this technology is real. It has become very much part of our daily lives. And if you extrapolate it into the near future, needless to say, the first uh, people who are going to be you know, using this technology is obviously going to be on the battlefield through the development of sophisticated neural weapons, which will create a perpetual state of uncertainty with the promise and also peril of the development of neural warfare and its effects. And this is what the future looks like. Yeah, I mean, even in my limited research, you know, the stuff I've come across reading this stuff, it you're spot on when it comes to the research that's being done, and there's way more. In fact, I would really, really, really encourage people to get their hands on your book. The uh, Let's see, it's Trans Evolution, The Coming Age of Human Deconstruction. That's right. People can get it. I think it's it's available all over America, but easiest thing to do is probably get it through Amazon. <clears throat> I'll call my publisher, tryingday.com, Chris Milligan. But uh, I have to tell you that you know, we've done about 200 interviews in the past two and a half, three weeks. And uh, <clears throat> I, you know, I hope I have enough voice left for the rest of the week because it's, it's a Monday. But, uh, uh, you know, the point is, is that uh, it's 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 a shocking look. I don't mean to scare people because it's not the point of the book at all, but it certainly helps you understand how technology, synthetic biology, space exploration. There's a chapter that deals ex explaining to people how you know conquer the conquest of space and asteroids and all these private companies who are you know who are launching on this uh, on this race against the clock to conquer the moon, get to Mars, conquer the asteroids around the planet Earth in order to uh, build them for the natural resources there, how all of these elements play out and form part of this one continuum, which is controlled from behind the scenes by the Shadow Masters. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm just going to leave it and say asking people to, to find your book and look up some of the uh, other articles that you've uh, had something to, um, to do with putting out there. You've done excellent work there, Daniel. And really, thank you very much for sharing this with our audience. Thank you so much for having me on your show again. Okay. And uh, that concludes this segment of Unlock the Door Radio. And uh, hope people will tune in again next week. Thank you again, Daniel. And uh, God bless. Take care, sir. Okay.